So I would like to welcome everyone to our uh, COVID-19 pelvic health su support meeting. Um, I think the reason that a, a group of us decided to do this was that uh, within pelvic health physiotherapy, there are kind of specific things that, that we as physiotherapists do that may be slightly different to um, maybe musculoskeletal or other areas of physiotherapy. So we thought it would be good to um, just get a group of us together and really kind of discuss some of those issues. And I'd like to say a really big thanks to all the panelists who, you, who I will introduce separately. So a really big thanks to them for um, all saying yes very quickly. I would in particular like to thank Myra because Myra has kind of been a, a lot of the energy behind this. And Myra's also invested a lot of time with putting the uh, kind of COVID-19 um, kind of documents together, kind of the standard operating procedures. And, and you can find those in the Facebook group. So there's like a COVID-19 pelvic health support group. And uh, I've put a link to that in the chat. And I'll also, so that's at the start of the chat, you'll see that. Uh, I would also like to thank Jem, because Jem is, Jem Oliver is, is also going to speak. So Jem um, set up a COVID-19 support group for physios on Facebook. And, and that's really gathered huge momentum. And it's, it's been a real source of support to a uh, huge number of therapists, uh, especially in the days when we weren't really clear maybe whether we could reopen, what we had to, so, so big thanks to Jem for that. Um, I'm not sure how she actually manages that group because it seems to kind of run all the time, but, uh, but thank you for that. Uh, we, lots of people have found the chat function, so uh, you know, please use that. It gives you a, a way to kind of, kind of interact with each other. And at the bottom of your screen, you will also see a Q&A, so please feel free to submit some questions in there, and we will kind of pick some of those questions up and, and, and hopefully uh, provide you with a start, start on how to answer those. And what I'd like to do is, first of all, uh, introduce Natalie Beswetherick from the CSP. So I'm really delighted Natalie's here because I, I kind of messaged Natalie and, she, and she, within a minute she said, I'll do it. So I, we really appreciate you because I know, I think actually you're currently on holidays, Natalie, but I suppose at the minute you can either go to your garden or the kitchen or so I suppose it's, so it's really good that you're with us. So, so Natalie's going to do, uh, speak to us now. Brilliant, Natalie. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to only do a, really a very, very short uh, piece because this is about your questions and us answering them. Um, we know that um, physiotherapists, particularly in the independent sector, are really keen to get to back to face-to-face -face consultations. And um, we have guidance uh, on the website um, to support uh, those people who want to get back to face-to-face -face consultations, as I know uh, Physio First have. Um, it's all about that uh, risk assessment. It's all about your PPE. It's all about recording what you do and your rationale for your decision making and you're you're clear to go and that seems really easy but i know it's not it is really hard to actually get all those things in place um, it just takes time and, and thoughts about how you're going to manage uh, opening up uh, a practice again um, so hopefully the guidance into, including the flow chart that's there on the website will help people uh, complete with checklists on seven areas that really are critical uh, will help people actually get back to the important areas. So if there's any uh, questions I can help with later on, I look forward to receiving them. Thanks very much, Gerald. Thank you. I think one question that, that's kind of come through kind of in the build up to this meeting is that, so currently we are uh, doing online screening and then if we determine that there is a need for face-to-face -face, uh, appointment, that we can do that. So does the CSP envisage when that might change, or is that just an, an unknown? At the moment, Gerard, I think that's an unknown. Um, we're all 
in a new normal. Um, some people think that we're going to wake up in a, a couple of days and it's going to go back to the way it was. And that's definitely not the case. Uh, we're all having to make real massive changes to the way we work uh, because of this pandemic. It has changed the face of physiotherapy and we may not see where we were again um, because things will change um, permanently. Um, so our guidance at the moment in line with the UK government wide advice is that you should do that online screening, um, make your risk assessments. And if you deem that you need to do a face to face, absolutely fine. But you have to follow all that risk assessment, uh, PPE, uh, consent, etc. Thanks, sir. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we, we, we will have some more questions for you later. Thank you very much. Right. Now I'm going to hand over to, to Jem. And Jem, before you speak about, about, maybe you could just tell us also what you've been doing over the last few weeks in terms of the, the group you set up. Yeah, sure. And um, I set up the group, I think it was just, it was mid-March. So it's been going for about three months now. And I think I was just, just chatting to a few friends, physio friends, when it was all very confusing. We were all still open at that point. And obviously we were very apparent that this was now, you know, something that was very serious. And we'd gone from something where I don't think many of us at first knew what was going to hit us, you know, if anybody did. And it was those very initial stages and there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of um maybe anger because nobody knew what was going on and I think I spoke to a couple of friends and said look we just need to discuss this together let's chuck a group together literally and and see if we can share it and it kind of went from there and I I you know at the time I know I worked for a booper in a triage role uh, which I love but at the time we were very very quiet so it did give me a little bit of time as well as working to actually put this together but put the group together just to share information and resources for people to put on so we all kind of knew where to go and it very much went from there and then over you know the past few you know 10 weeks the situation as you said Gerard before has evolved you know we went through the phase of um, you know, should we close? <laughs> and, you know, are we closing? And is it right to stay open? And through, you know, which the rest of the country has been through uh, in various phases of, of trying to gain the situation, not only from a personal point of view, but from a professional. You know, we then went through a lot of legalities of people wondering about, you know, from a small business point of view, as many physiotherapists and other professions are self-employed. We went through that, so that grew in support. Um, and then we opened up very much to different healthcare professionals because I think, you know, we've got a lot to offer and I think there's a lot of there's very similar themes going across the whole profession at the moment. And, and again, uh, we are now in sort of 10, 11 weeks later and have built an amazing community, I think, from different people sharing ideas. There's a safe space. There's no judgment. You know, I, I, I wanted people to, to be able to speak freely because I think, you know, as I mentioned before, I think it's a very scary time. And as we are all confident practitioners, nobody knows, nobody knew this was going to happen and nobody knows how to cope with it. So I think there's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of anxiety and I've had some lovely messages from people saying it's just reassuring to share things and read things that other people are doing that are in a very similar situation to themselves so we now have a great you know bank of 1.4 thousand people contributing to that group and sharing resources and I'm thrilled I, you know I'm really really thrilled that you know it's taken off but that people are finding it very very useful um, and it's got all the resources and it's evolving as our situation changes we're trying to sort of keep it quite apparent and it's 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 run and fed by all the people in it you know and I said you said before you don't know how I run it I, I don't really run it you know I think I just sort of monitor a few things and try and keep the themes going and you know it's great to be involved in things like this because it shows that different we're all thinking along the same hymn sheet and we're thinking about different things so um, but a few of the things, so, you know, Jero asked me to be involved with this and I was thrilled because I think it's just really, really nice to share some of my thoughts and some of the things that I've learned over the past sort of, you know, few weeks or so. And I've just written down a few themes um, of things that have cropped up regularly in the group. And as, you know, Natalie mentioned that a lot of the things that we're in the situation we're now in, especially as a physiotherapy profession, that we need, really need to focus on, you know, there's so much information out there at the moment. You know, it's really about us now digesting it all, taking it all in in our own time.
looking after ourselves and trying to move forward with it. So I've just started a few key things down that I think are quite important that maybe if you are struggling, you just need to think about. Okay, so the first one is sort of confidence in your own ability. You know, as I said before, we are all very good professionals you're all very good at your job uh, you will clearly love your job um, and and it's it's something that i think you need to start believing in yourself a little bit more and there's a wide spectrum of this and it's sometimes easier said than done but that confidence in your ability needs you know it, it will come back and i think sometimes uh, even things are scary and there's a difficult difference in change uh, we are in a new normal and I think you will find your way again so if you are a bit nervous and you think there's too much information and you're worried about getting back out there have confidence in yourself take a break and just think about what's happening and, and do things at your own pace and try not to sort of judge yourself against you know what everybody else is doing as well and um, the second thing that I alluded to was that we are in a new normal um, and this has been said before and I think it will become a theme you know people are saying like you've just mentioned that you know when are we going to get back to normal I don't think that's about to happen in any way, shape or form, not just for the healthcare profession, but in general for a long, long time. And I think it's something that once you, or for me, once I made peace with that, it started to make things a little bit easier for me. And it's about finding a way for you to use your own practice and develop it within that new normal. Now that's gonna look different for everyone. You may still feel like you want a little bit of time. And there's certainly a lot of people in the group that are saying, I'm not ready to open yet. And that is, there is no problem with that. I think you just need to bear in mind and make yourself a plan of what it's gonna look like for you and how you're gonna be able to build on the business and the skills that you've been doing for a long time. Um, I think the next thing is to take a break, take a breath. I'm a huge mental health advocate. You know, I've, I've been quite open about the fact that I've struggled quite a lot. Um, and it is something I think that's quite important anyway, especially at the moment. There's so much information out there. You're all hugely passionate about the work, whatever work you do. I think it's important that you take some time out um, and, and close the laptop. You know, in the past few weeks, I started to feel it all sort of get on top of me a little bit. I've spoken to a few people and reached out to some people that I speak to and have some therapy sessions and naturally now I'm starting to feel a lot better and I feel like it's all sort of leveling out a bit and I've got a nicer balance so you know that might hit you at different times you might feel absolutely fine but still take a break because this is a lot there's a lot going on professionally and you know country and worldwide just make sure you take time for yourself and switch off from all the policies and the guidance and the planning um, to make sure you enjoy what you like doing. Um, the next thing is sort of reconnecting with your patients. I think um, we are all so conscious, sorry, of, of getting things right and making sure we're ticking all the boxes. I think sometimes it's easy to forget that actually there's a huge patient group out there that really, really want this treatment. And I'm sure a lot of you have found that. And actually, it's just about reconnecting with them and building back in some of their confidence. And you'll find that, you know, I've come across this from a, you know, a triage point of view myself. Some patients are massively keen to get back in and they're not bothered and they have the therapist that they love and they want to go and see them. And that's great. But we have some that I'm coming across who are scared to go outside and I think you know you may never change that but actually reaching out and, and, and giving them the reassurance of what you're doing or the different options that they have may be, may be different so maybe take a side step from your policies and everything that you're trying to plan and think about the group think about different ways that you can reach out to them whether that be you know different emails maybe little zoom calls and loads of people are doing little free sessions with either pilates or conditioning or whatever and I think that's that's really good because remember as well as yourself changing everything for your patient group it's also changing and I think sometimes we can lose the communication and getting that across to them um, uh, reaching out and sharing to others maybe small self plugs in my own group there or our own development and, and groups like this you know if you have a speciality like the pelvic health you know reach out to your own cohort and reach out to others you know we are now a healthcare group the Facebook support group is open to any therapist and healthcare professional and I and I wanted to maintain that specifically because there's so much that can be gleaned for the professionals and I'm really proud of that and, I, and I'm glad because now we have a co collaboration where actually not just within physio but we can see how different other practices are working and glean confidence and collaboration from that so reach out to other people you know if you are concerned reach out to your group and, and discuss it and you might just find that there's things that you may not have thought about um, and then fi finally moving on from that the collaboration and the cross working what I found you know from my own profession and you know other chiropractors and osteopaths and podiatrists and, and doctors that I work with 
over the past few weeks, the collaboration that's come together has been phenomenal, you know, just not just on our group, but across, you know, you'll have seen it in your own communities and then especially in the NHS. And I think that's very warming. And it's something that I think I'm going to really hold on to, you know, in my new normal, that the fact that we can all get through this and work through it and come out the other side, maybe different, but maybe better, I think is something that we need to cling on to and, and, and be positive about in what, what we share. So. That's it from me for the time being. Hope uh, that makes sense and I'll answer some more questions if I can with it. Jim, can I just ask you a question? It's it's a it's a really uh it's it's probably a question I hadn't I hadn't really thought of in the last couple of weeks, but uh, all of the support seems to be running through Facebook, which is a you know it's a very it's a it's a great medium and it's it's something that that lots of us use a lot. But someone's just made a point that if they aren't on Facebook where can people find information? I suppose my answer to that would be that this is this is such an important, relevant topic for us as physiotherapists returning to work that I think if someone's not on Facebook, I think they almost need to maybe make that decision and go on Facebook and, and get that information. But do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think it is interesting because like you say, not everybody is, but you know, for various reasons and that's absolutely fine. I think one of the things from my point of view and the reason it's been maybe the group has been so successful is it's it's easy. Now, some people don't think it's easy and whatever your views are on social media, um, I wonder whether that's because it is easy and people find it nice to chat the information is out there and and you know again i go back to saying that the group is run and developed by the people in it i'm not sat every night writing content and content i'm just kind of pushing things out there that are already there and i think for me it's about making it easier and, and disseminating information and this is conversations i've had with various different people and the group is a nice way to do that so i think you're right i think if people are struggling if they're not bothered about it maybe they can it can be shared through friends but for me, I think if I wasn't on Facebook and I was hearing about the, the benefit that people were getting and just being able to read and, and have all the information in one go, it may be, like you say, something that, that is, you know, looked upon or, you know, maybe you share links or maybe you do Zoom. But yeah, I think it's it's an individual decision sometimes, isn't it? So. And I think another question, you've, you've talked about some of the themes that have come up in the group and, and you you now, you, you know, you've got very big numbers there to, to kind of pull some themes out of. Is there a feeling that, that the public is ready to come back to physiotherapy? Um, yes. I've got some things in the pipeline. We're going to do another, uh, hopefully, a Zoom uh, like this um, um, within the group Q&A, you know, in the next couple of weeks, because I want people to share experiences now. I want people to show people that actually when they've opened the doors, what it's like you know i don't i don't work in in practice face to face at the moment so i haven't got any first hand experience but hopefully that will show actually this confidence and for me that is the next step that once we've done all you've all everyone's done all this hard work we need to show that this is actually working and i think that in itself will give confidence and we and and what we will do then we have some other crap but we will come back to Gemma because we'll, yeah. uh, we'll give you a little bit but thank you very much okay so next up we are going to have uh, i'm really delighted that that karen is here um, it is safe to say that uh, the uh, Karen and her Physio First team have been incredibly busy over the last few weeks and they've done amazing work to support both their members and their, the physiotherapists who are members. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's really admirable what they're doing. So a really big thanks to, because uh, I, I have a feeling Karen is a very busy person at the moment. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Jared. Yeah, I mean, the, the situation at Physio First, obviously, clearly, you know, we know that there are people in private practice that aren't members of Physio First. So we made the decision very early on um, in this crisis that we would make all our resources and support um, available to all private practitioners, not just those who were members of Physio First. So we we've published daily bulletins that have been have gone out as an e-bulletin to members but which then straight away become faqs on a de on a dedicated covid pe covid page and it's all on the physio first website it's on the front page and it's all detailed there um and it, um and then highlighted on social media i mean Gemma's uh, facebook group she's just talked about quite extensively physio first has a has a facebook page uh, but we've actually probably used twitter more over this crisis um we've um you know we've we've started out with interpreting the financial support for small businesses from the government 
Um, we published an e-booklet around remote consultations once all the practices were closed and people had to move to re remote working. So we put all the, uh, all the resources together in that. Um, and we started to, you know, cast around for groups that we could ally ourselves with for lobbying um, to look at the gaps in the provision for small businesses, such as a lot of um, private practitioners. Um, and so we've worked alongside the CSP with that. We've worked alongside other healthcare professionals. Um, I've had a meeting just an hour ago with ARMA subgroup. So I'm in constant contact with the osteopaths and the chiropractors, uh, BASRATs, sports therapists, podiatrists, and so on. Um, and throughout all of that, we've in, tried to interpret the, the advice from the NHS and from, from uh, public health for our particular circumstances for private practitioners and uh, now looking at a return to face-to-face -face appointments with appropriate measures in place and the latest booklet that we well the bulletin that we published on friday has got um, all of our all of those things that i've just talked about it's a the main one is a booklet called how to connect with your patient which is um sorry guidance for opening up your practice which has got the risk assessment document in with questions to walk you through how to prepare your practice for face-to-face -face PPE, uh, risk assessment screening, um, and all of that is in there. And I'm just wondering if I can share my screen. I've put it all into a Word document. So would that be helpful to do that now? Yeah, that would be, that would be great. Um, because it's got all the links in it. And I'm happy to talk about it in more detail, obviously the bits in it, but I did put it all in the Word document. So just give me one second and I will find it. Okay, let me just do share screen. Oh, hang on. Uh, okay, this is it. Yeah, there we go. So hopefully everybody can see that. So this is the the main one here is the link which gets you to that e-booklet. Um, and these ones below are all in that. So you just need that this first link really in blue. But it's basically got full guidance for considering face to face for for um, return to practice. The template to record that you've thought about everything, which is how it will work in practice for your particular um, building circumstances or your practice circumstances, including domiciliary visits. Um, gaining informed consent because it's important that your consent um, mentions COVID-19. It's you know you can't just have a disclaimer. You've got to make sure that you've had that conversation with the patient. Um, and we're still saying that you know you do your risk assessment and if at all possible you do we have a virtual first approach so you you know people have moved to remote working and Jared I know you've been doing um, quite a lot of work on that um, successfully so if you can see the patient virtually then great if your risk benefit analysis tells you that you aren't able to make substantial change to the patient in terms of symptom reduction or pain reduction and that a face-to-face -face appointment is then appropriate, then you've got the steps to go through and the risk assessment discussion with the patient in there. Then there's a link to the PPE. I've noticed one or two questions coming up from attendees tonight about PPE, so that all of the guidance is in there for that. And then last of all is um, just a link to all our business um, frequently asked questions. Brilliant. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I don't have to get that off this one now. Take that off. Um, <laughs> I can't get it off now. Uh, wait a minute. Nice. Screen sharing. Oh, there we are. Stop share. That's it. Thank you. Um, and just the last thing to say that, you know, whilst we know that members are still, um, you know, struggling, everybody's situation is totally different. And we also have a LinkedIn forum, but that's just for Physio First members. But certainly on uh, Twitter and our public facing Facebook page and our LinkedIn page, everything goes on there as well. And we're now starting to think about rebuilding practices once face to face is back. I think you're absolutely right. It's not, as Natalie said, it's not going to go back to um, normal. We're going to be in this new normal um, for, for quite some time. And so as well as rebuilding confidence in, in uh, physiotherapists, we need to look at patients' confidence in us. And so one of the things that Physio First um, is very keen on is, is um, 
demonstrating quality outcomes. So our scheme that uh, some of the attendees might have heard of is called Data for Impact. And we have a quality assured practitioner and quality assured clinic scheme. And all the details of that are on the Physio First website as well. Um, but it's one way of showing, demonstrating to your patients that actually, you know, you, you're able to get really good outcomes with your treatment. And that's done in collaboration with the University of Brighton, so it's independently uh, validated. Brilliant, Karen. Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing those documents. That's, that's really valuable. Just when we have you, and, and obviously we will probably discuss this a bit later as well, is uh, there are kind of common questions coming up, and they, they kind of are being sent to us before we... Uh, before this evening as well is that there's kind of been talk around that if if the decision is made that there's justification for doing a face-to-face -face appointment so that so they've been through the online screen and we have decided that we need to see this patient face to face so we do that with the uh, so do we have to limit our con our time within that two meters i.e treating that patient hands-on do we need to limit is there a 15 minute kind of window that we need to limit that to? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very difficult to, you know, be absolute about this because obviously every, every practice is different, every patient is different. And this is why it, you're, as an autonomous practitioner, you've got to do this risk assessment and you've got to have these conversations with your patient. But that 15 minute window has come from government advice about social distancing, you know, keeping the two meters apart and spending as little time as possible. So try to limit your time uh, closer than the two meters to 15 minutes or less. Now, obviously I'm not a pelvic, uh, I'm not a women's health physio, but certainly in an MSK context, you might say that, you know, when your patient comes in, you can do your subjective assessment observing social distancing you can do your objective assessment or very much of it apart from when you perhaps need to be hand holding yeah. or, or guiding or whatever you can do that at two meters distance you can talk through your exercise and your plan and your advice and so on all of that can be done with maintaining social distancing so what we're saying in effect is your hands-on um therapy if you are doing any manual therapy or any soft tissue work try and limit that to within 15 minutes that's that's where that guideline comes from and then just one last thing in that so is that a is that so if we is that a, like a continuous 15 minutes or like 15 minutes within that hour or is that open to um, interpretation I think that's open to interpretation because obviously everybody works in a different way. But I think it's more, you know, being aware of that being the guideline to limit because this is all about infection control and limiting risk, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's been really helpful. Uh, right, Karen, thank you. There are other questions to you, but uh, I'll let you get a brief. Thank you very, very much. I really, really, really appreciate it, Julia. Right. Uh, Next, we're going to uh, hear from Katie. Katie is the uh, POGP chair. So re a really big thanks to Katie for joining us. We really appreciate it. And Katie, I will. Uh, some of the panellists just might need to mute. There's a little bit of echo. And Katie, over to you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me this evening. And um, I'm here to set out the position of the POGP. So for those of you who are not members of POGP, um, I am the chair of the professional network and I'm also a clinical uh, practitioner. I'm working in NHS and I have worked in the private sector as well. So um, I'm up against the same challenges as all of us in this COVID crisis. And I'm really interested to share information, resources and communication as well. So thank you to the previous speakers. It's good to hear the latest thoughts and it's a massive task to keep up with all the changes, but I agree with all the sentiments that have been expressed so far. As a membership organization, we as POGP are not involved in professional practice. So we look to the CSP as our governing body, Physio First and our employers for specific guidance and developing risk assessments. And what Karen was showing us earlier um, is going to be absolutely invaluable for starting up our clinics again. So we really appreciate the work that they've put in for that. So much of the focus of POGP is on training and development. Uh, the resources that we've all received from the CSP on a daily basis have been invaluable in supporting decisions on local um, POGP as an organization has no authority to advise members, but we are there as a community to support each other 
and to share experiences and thoughts and be supportive of each other. So we also have a responsibility to the whole of the UK. So to help address the local differences, we have our area of network representatives that can help support local members with their geographical challenges. As was discussed earlier on, we know that only 50% of our 900 strong membership actually use our Facebook forum. And of that 50%, 57%, two thirds of those are based in London and the South. So the use of Facebook for communication is quite a limitation to us for the membership as a whole. So we as an organization are launching a new very interactive website in the autumn and we hope this is going to improve our communication to our wider membership and to the public and be a valuable support. So what have we done so far? Well, during the restrictions on face-to-face, -face, we have provided the free patient information resources on our booklets that have been downloaded and printed and used and emailed to patients um, when they've been to support their telephone and video consultations. We Oh, am I, have I been muted? No, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I've been silenced. <laughs> sorry, it's fine. All right, so um, the publications, of, uh, the use of the, the publications for circulation is really useful um, because it's appropriate, it's evidence-based, it's peer-reviewed and it's current. We've already had some discussions on our, and within our groups um, on signposting members to resources available at the time. But as we're aware, these are updating on a daily basis and it's difficult for any one group to keep uh, updated. So we do, we do look to Physio First and the CSP as being our main sources of updated information. We've also made free to members an infographics poster directing people who may have developed new or worsening symptoms of pelvic floor problems to seek help from a specialist physio. And we're really pleased that it's been taken up by the Royal College of Midwifery, Royal College of Obs and Gynae, and the Maternity Transformation and Women's Health Policy Team at NHS England. And the Royal College of GPs are now specifically asking postnatal women with regards to pelvic floor post COVID dysfunction. So we are investigating as an organisation how we can continue to support physios with their learning and development within the restrictions on travel and gatherings and we're looking into our, our online learning and video meetings. We are also involved with academic research and looking at the implications of how practice will change looking forward. So we know of some work that's currently in the planning stages but we would be very keen to be involved with any other projects moving forward from now. Brilliant, Katie. And what we could do is we've just had some very, very specific pelvic health questions. Okay. Uh, which some of your members have also highlighted. Uh, some of your very distinguished members. Uh, so, currently, a lot of a lot of pelvic health physios will see patients who are who are pregnant. Yeah. So, how do we stand there? It, it is a difficult one. We are a hands-on hands -on profession and we, this is the way that we've always worked and we've always prided ourselves on being hands-on, but we are very restricted by the, 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 well, just where we're all at at the moment. So each case has to be taken as an individual. You have to do your own risk assessments depending on where you're working. You have to abide by the rules that we've already had outlined. You have to have the appropriate PPE. We have to consider that uh, digital first, remote, um, see what information can be passed without the face-to-face, -face, limit the length of time that you are in a face-to-face -face if you have to, but each individual patient would have to have an individual risk assessment for the condition that right. you need to be seeing that, them that, for. That makes sense. And then someone's also asked, and I think Karen has probably answered this to, uh, to a degree, is that because of the, the internal work that we do, some patients may have a chaperone or they may bring so they may have a chaperone so if that's the case if, if we have if it's been justified that that patient needs to be seen and they want to bring a chaperone which otherwise that they might not have that appointment do we just then maintain socially distance from two people I've not actually had to consider it but obviously chaperoning policies have to be seen in their own context if a patient brings somebody in, that's not necessarily a legal chaperone, as we know, and that is more of a supporter for the patient. 
And so we would have to consider the patient's needs, but also the needs of the department. And I think you'd have to have that discussion with the patient and maybe with your infection control team in anticipation. Maybe Natalie would be able to have a little bit more information for us regarding that. Perfect. And then the next question, really everyone really appreciates this, Katie, is, uh, you know, the question everyone's asking is that for a lot of both female pelvic health patients and male pelvic health patients, it may be that they need a, either a vaginal ass assessment, a rectal assessment. So if it's justified that they need that, one, is that an, enough justification to, to do a face-to-face -face appointment? And secondly, if, if we're doing that and we can do that in less than 15 minutes, can we do that or do we just need to do that on a case-by-case -case basis? I would direct people to looking at the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology guidelines and the sexual health guidelines and they're quite clear, the Organisation for Sexual Health, and I really can't remember the name off the top of my head, um, but they have quite clear guidelines and they are doing procedures that are very similar. They're non-aerosol generating procedures and so the level of PPE that's required, the um, if you think about inserting a Mirena coil or replacing a, um, a pessary, then we should only be considered along the same lines of infection control as those sort of procedures. Brilliant. And then I think I know the answer to this one myself, but I'll let you answer it. Uh, is that if the patient feels that they want to have a face-to-face -face appointment, but we feel we cannot justify that, presumably they don't have that face-to-face -face appointment. It, it has to be a two-way conversation. Um, and I, I, it's absolutely got to be a two-way conversation and you'd have to have very justification why you would see somebody just as much as why you wouldn't see somebody or vice versa as it were. Katie thank you very very much uh, so I didn't mute you in part I was trying to mute the person who has heard all the echo so in order to, to mute yourself but we got you back uh, we only lost you for five seconds okay thank you very much Re we really really appreciate it and next we are going to hear from Myra and Myra is going to talk about uh, really signpost to some of the uh, policies she's put together and I'd like to also thank Bill Taylor who's a lot of us know Bill from Edinburgh and it's uh, Bill has generated uh, has invested a lot of work in doing his policies which he has kind of handed to us which is brilliant uh, so Myra thank you so what I've done is pull together five principles from the um, private practice sector from Bill Sop, from my uh, NHS Trust work and from everything that we've been reading and discussing that I think really underpin everything that's already been said here today. I think the first thing is the vulnerability of our patients and the service I work in has a large uh, percentage of patients who are quite elderly and quite frail. So we're starting to resume face to face by selecting the patients that are lower down on that risk group. So we're looking at leaving some of the pregnant patients from the over 70s and the shielded patients for the moment and starting with some of the others. The second one, which I think is probably more important than anything else, is really the risks of not treating people compared to the risks of treating people. And Katie's already mentioned this, and it will be different for every single person. And I think that our group that Gerard set up on Facebook is really useful for this, that if you have a patient that you just don't know where to put them, whether it's face-to-face -face or stay online, feel free to discuss it within the group or contact one of us and talk it through because there is no right or wrong and it's all about our critical decision making. But for some patients, an online or telephone assessment is just not going to elicit the information that we need. It's a really difficult topic to discuss and sometimes that face-to-face -face appointment is really important, particularly with some of our older patients who perhaps are not confident with technology. Although having said that, I think a lot of us probably fall into that group as well. Then there's the consent process, and I think that's really important. And in the documents I put together, the one from our hospital discusses consenting specifically to speak to somebody or see somebody in this COVID situation, and then re-consenting if we do anything objective with them or put our hands upon them, and documenting that as well. And documentation is really key. As some of the other speakers have said, documentation of our thinking, why we're seeing somebody, why we're choosing not to see somebody. And I think patient choice in this is really important. And one of the um, suggested sort of letters I put in the pack was a letter you could put up in a clinic or waiting area that 
supports the patient in taking some decision making for seeing us because it's not just about what we're saying and what we're thinking. The patients can read the news as well, they can read the guidelines, they can make a decision on what they want and what's important to them and we're there to help them to make that decision and make what's right for them. And then the final principle really is the, is the one about the future. We're very focused on now and we're living in an environment that, that is very now centric. But actually, what about our patients six months down the line, a year down the line, two years down the line? If we build up an enormous waiting list in the NHS or in private practice, or if businesses start to fold and private practitioners need to lose staff, it's going to have a very negative impact on our patients further down the line if there aren't the staff and the skills and facilities to manage them. So I think we also owe it to the patients of later on to start seeing the patients that are around now. So I think we, we can have confidence in that. We can start to make those decisions, talk to those patients and talk to each other. Once we start doing it, I think it will become clearer and we'll start to become more confident in our own thinking. So these documents that I've mentioned are all on the Facebook group. And what I'd like to ask is that everybody who's spoken tonight and has referred to a document, if you could post it on the Facebook group, or you could email it to Gerard or I, if that is easier, and then we can make sure that we share it with everybody else. That's brilliant, Myra. That's, and, and I've said it before, but just a really huge thanks for the amount of work you have invested in this, because uh, I know you were busy with all your other commitments, but, uh, and just to, just to reiterate, so we've said it a few times, so this is the uh, COVID-19 Pelvic Health Physiotherapy Support Group on Facebook. I will, after this, well, it'll probably be first thing in the morning, I will email everyone a link to that, but if you look back through the chat, uh, I'll put it in again, uh, but at the start of the chat, the first, the first comment is one by me, which gives you a link to that group. So it's the pelvic health, it's the COVID-19 pelvic health physiotherapy support group. Or if you put that into the Facebook search, uh, that will come up as well. Uh, I suppose a couple of questions then, Myra, for you, but, uh, Myra, is that a, a few people have, have talked about, so Katie answered about the, uh, the internal, internal word. Uh, it's things like, you know, doing transabdominal ultrasound, transperineal ultrasound. What, what, what are your feelings on those? I see no reason to ban anything. I think it's all got a place and it depends on what we think our patient needs. And until someone can turn around and say, you must not do X, Y, and Z, then I think we owe it to our patients to give them the best possible treatment and support that we can whilst being sensible. Um, so I, I would go ahead and do whatever you think is right for your practice with that patient. That's brilliant. Okay, we have, thank you very, very much. Okay, we have some uh, other questions. So I'll put these to the panel and I will, uh, direct them and then so i'll direct them to one person then other people can chip in i think as expected uh, everyone wants to know about ppe because uh, i think sometimes the more you read about this uh, the, the more kind of confusing it gets to uh, i think there's a general consensus maybe and you can correct me if i'm wrong and i'll direct this probably to, to natalie um, is that you know we probably should be wearing aprons gloves masks but it's kind of unclear uh, maybe what type of mask and then some people are wearing visors but other people aren't so where do we where do we stand on that Natalie sorry about this I'm sure you're I'm sure you're fed up of PPE questions <laughs> I've learned more about PPE than I've ever known about in my life before I tell you Gerard, but um, the I've, I've answered a couple of the questions about uh, on this um, for Standard droplet precautions, which most outpatient areas would be, um, it is, as you've just said, it would be a fluid repellent surgical mask, apron and gloves. The risk assessment part is whether you should wear um, some of those things for the whole session or per individual patient that you need to determine. So um, there's a whole range of um, issues about masks if they get 
uncomfortable or they get damp inside, you should replace them. So that, that's the only bit that you need to determine whether you're going to wear something for a session or an individual patient. And if in, if in doubt, you, you probably need to actually wear it for individual patients, take it all off, dispose of it in, in, a, in a bag to get rid of, uh, and then start again with your next patient. So uh, that's the most important part. Um, you, it, it, generally, you shouldn't need a patient to wear a mask unless you've judged that there is a significant risk uh, to yourself uh, if, if the, that patient's got a say for a cough and you don't know whether they are COVID or not. So you may actually want them to wear a fluid repellent surgical mask as well. But in the main, uh, and Karen can actually confirm this, um, is that, that that's what um, the droplet precautions actually advocate. Thank you. And I think that has been crystal clear. That has been crystal clear. And I think if people will take lots out of tonight, but I think that has, been, that has answered that. Uh, and in terms of wa clinical waste disposal, is that just as, as, our, as we did before, but do you have to hold it for 72 hours, is it? Or? You just need to follow the uh, guidance, um, your infection control procedures locally, uh, and whatever the guidance um, says from Public Health England, remember um, that that issue is, uh, although it says Public Health England, is actually UK wide. So one thing that is actually remained UK wide is the whole of PPE. So wherever you are, if you're on, working across borders or anything, it doesn't matter because it's the same. So follow your infection control procedures outlined um, in uh, the health and safety uh, executives, uh, as well as the Public Health England guidance. Brilliant. That has been, there was real clarity in that answer. Okay, uh, I've got another question, which I think I will, I will throw out to Karen. Uh, that's okay, Karen. And this is just a very practical question that, that I suppose it applies, it applies probably more to people in private practice. So there will be some people who've, who work in quite small treatment rooms, maybe in you know, smaller clinics. And if that treatment room doesn't allow you to you know, do that history taking, do a lot of that assessment at two meters. So if you're basically almost a bit on top of the patient when you're, or you've got very small distance between them, is it a case really of looking to work elsewhere in, in another more spacious room? Well, yes, I mean, I saw that question come up and I appreciate, you know, people's circumstances are very different. So um, what I would say is you, you've got to have the principle of trying to maintain social distancing in your mind all the time. You've got to have, as Natalie just said, exactly the, the PPE and we would advise, you know, disposable mask, disposable, a, uh, sorry, disposable gloves and apron per patient and a fluid resistant mask, which can be per session. Um, so you might in a smaller space or talking about your pelvic health physio, I saw a question before that, you know, if you're checking for stress incontinence and you want to ask the patient to cough, you, you might like to have that discussion before you see the patient face to face. That's part of your risk assessment for that particular situation to say, look, we will be doing this procedure. You probably it will make you cough. So would you like to would you feel more comfortable wearing a mask or I would like you to wear a mask? Now, if you're asking the patient to wear a mask, maybe you want to provide one for them or if it's part of your sort of. Um, you know, you're taking into account the confidence level of the patient, the mental health of the patient. You might have that conversation. Would you feel more comfortable coming in a, you know, with a face covering? And if the patient says yes, then go ahead. Now, in a smaller space, that might be a sensible thing to do to say to the patient, you know, would you mind? We're in quite a small enclosed space. So would you be happy to wear a face covering or a mask? You know, that might be one way around it, which would yeah, and seem I think that, common I, sense. I think, Karen, that, uh, same again, a bit, <laughs> a bit like Natalie. Sorry, I cough there. I feel I should step back from the screen. <laughs> I, I think a bit like Natalie, that, that answer will give people a lot of uh, reassurance. And, and thank you for your clarity. Uh, I am mindful of the time. I just want to ask a colleague of mine a question. So we have someone here who has just gone back to work clinically doing musculoskeletal and pelvic health and maybe just a sentence or two of what what the reality is like in terms of what's it like wearing the PPE 
What's it like doing some of the internal work? Are the public ready? So Adrian, I'm just going to ask you to speak very briefly for a moment. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, I went back uh, last week to do a, uh, to see a few patients that uh, were not really coping very well, um, who were deteriorating. Um, that's both musculoskeletal and um, uh, male pelvic pain. Um, the male pelvic pain chaps I'd seen uh, online and uh, felt that they would benefited from from coming in. Um, wearing PPE all day um, is is absolutely fine. Um, I feel very safe. The, the patients are, you know, we assess them virtually beforehand. Um, the ones, the vast majority I've seen uh, last week and, and today. Um, bear in mind, it's just from Wednesday last week. Um, we haven't seen that many. We only saw sort of about 15, um, no, actually 25 last week. And I've only I've seen about seven today. And um, we've spaced them out. Um, we've, you know, we've got a pretty robust, um, you know, operating procedure. It's only me working at the moment. And we've got a podiatrist in the practice as well, who's been really, really good because she's used to wearing PPE and she's used to wear it, you know, performing procedures where, you know, you're, aerosol producing um and i felt very safe we've we've been able to screen our patients beforehand you know we've listened to the guidance and we've really applied it to our our situation and really asked the question of you know when when is it safe to to go back to doing um you know face-to-face uh, -face, given that you know we i suppose we we were uh, uh, exempt as such from from actually closing um you know we've been able to do a lot of our treatments online and now now we're able to see see patients so i've i've not felt at all threatened patients have been very good and very honest we've been able to email their their consent forms out to them they electronically it's like a form they just tick all the boxes and sign at the bottom and it gets sent back and uploaded to their notes that's been really really good we can screen the patients when they come in and um you know um in terms of you said about specifically about doing any examinations um i haven't needed to on the, the couple of chaps that i've I bought in um, uh, the few chaps I bought in for pelvic pain, uh, but we have done uh, abdominal ultrasound. How I've managed each patient is I've asked them to wear a, a mask. Brilliant, and and, and brilliant Andy. Sorry for cutting, but that's. I think that, I, I think that will really. I think it's really nice to hear from someone who's uh, who's actually back doing this work. And I think I think a bit like Natalie, Karen, uh, it, it'll it'll give people confidence that. We, we can get back clinically, whether we're doing face-to-face -face in the NHS or some of the private hospitals or the, um, some of the independent companies or our own clinics. So I think it's really good and well done. I'd like to ask one last question uh, to my colleague and good friend, Lisa, because Lisa is a, so a lot of people will know Lisa. So Lisa is a very experienced uh, female, male, pediatric pelvic health physio. Uh, and she leads the service in New Cross in Wolverhampton. Um, I know there are people from abroad, so that's kind of near Birmingham. Um, and Lisa has been working in ITU and also on the COVID ward. So just to maybe give a sentence or two, Lisa, of what this has been like. So you've kind of gone from doing kind of very much outpatient pelvic health to doing COVID ITU. So, and maybe just give us a message of what things are like. Thank you. Yeah, it's... Um... It's been very strange. I've been uh, redeployed um, at New Cross Hospital to um, initially ITU, HDU, and then the wards for some hefty rehab post COVID. Um, it's been a huge learning curve, um, but one I'm actually very grateful for because I've brought a lot from that and I think I can take a lot back to the practice in terms of outpatient pelvic health. Um, I also realised that we will be seeing um, patients post-COVID, you know, recovering, rehabilitating um, with lots and lots of issues and understanding some of the scope of those issues that the patients are having. Um, it's been vital, really. Um, neurologically, you know, MSK-wise, the bowel and bladder are suffering terribly. Um, it's really, really complex. Um, and yeah i've been working with a fantastic team so i just feel it's made me a bit more of a rounded physio you know and i can bring a lot back to to the patients we're going to see 
Brilliant. Lisa, thank you very much, because I know it's, it's not the easy thing to, because I know it's been a, it's been a tough few weeks for you. Uh, so uh, finally, what I would like to say is just a really, really big thanks to those who came on the panel. There are also other people who kind of helped put this thing together. I would like to say a really big thanks to them. Uh, I'm a bit reluctant to mention in case I leave anyone out, but uh, I, I really, we, Myra and I really appreciate everyone's input. Uh, so a big thanks to all of those people, because actually you'll see them all on the panel. They're on the panel, but they just haven't spoken. So a big thanks to them. And also to my good friend, Elaine Miller, who was a big part of the, the drive to do this. So uh, big thanks to Elaine. Uh, thank you also to the to the people who've uh, given up an hour of their very busy Monday evening. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. And what we will do is uh, we've mentioned that the pelvic health support group on Facebook. So we will probably continue some of these conversations there. Not at the minute because we need to just uh, chill out and, and uh, calm down after this. And and I think as as Jem said, you know. We, we care a lot about our patients and our colleagues, but you know, it's, it's also important for us to, for all of us to take some time out as well. So, uh, so a really big thanks to those people who came and spoke. Uh, we really value your input. And uh, I think Myra and I feel that this, this, is, not the, this is not an end to this. This, is, this. this event this evening is kind of just the beginning really. So we will um, look at what, what else we plan to do to try and support ourselves and everybody else. So, uh, thank you all. Good night, and uh, thank you, thank you for your time, and thank you for your uh, energy and input and support. Thank you. Thank and you. you'll also get a recording of this as well. I'll just have to format it first, uh, and then you'll get that. Uh, you'll get an email via Eventbrite. Thank you. Thanks, Gerard. Yes, thanks, thanks everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.